Welcome to It Started With A Kick, the podcast in which well-known fans and high-profile figures in the world of football talk about the first match they ever attended. I'm your host, Richard Foss. I'm absolutely delighted to introduce today's guest, Dan Rutstein, who is joining us all the way from California. Dan is an AFC Wimbledon fan who previously worked as a diplomat and is currently president of Orange County Soccer Club, which we'll go into in a little bit more detail later. Dan has also refereed at a relatively high level in England, as well as in top flight matches in Bermuda. He also hosts a series of podcasts in the States, so he knows what all this stuff's about. Uh, So Dan, a very warm welcome. I can safely say that with your background as a former diplomat and a referee, that is certainly a first for this podcast. And with almost absolute certainty, the last time we have a guest who combines such skills. Super. Thank you very much for having me on. No, it's, it's a pleasure. And you know, I always like to encourage people from ev- across the world. I've had David Squires from Australia, your um, friend Jim Piddock, who was in California at the time, uh, and yourself. So, yeah, we're spreading the word across the world, which is good for the podcast. Uh, let's go to your first match and, and a little bit of background on that one. Saturday, the 16th of September, 1989. Take us to the ground. Take us to the game. Yeah, so actually, just quickly before I do, I think uh, when you invited me on this show, just trying to sort of work out my first game, like calling my dad, going through my old programs, like hopefully the episode ends up being entertaining, but I'm already sort of, this has taken me on a football journey because I'm... I'm not as old as Jim Piddock, but I'm old, and so <laughs> no um, one, no one's as old as Jim Piddock. Don't worry about that. <laughs> and uh, you know, it's a it's a long time ago, and you know, it's it's fun to go back and think about those days. And I think, you know, the fun thing I think, in a way, when I look back on that game. So you know, I was I was a kid. Uh, I, I feel like, like my dad wasn't into football. Um, we were. I guess probably one of the rare families in that part of South London where my family just weren't into football. My dad was from South Africa. He just wasn't into football. Um, so, you know, games were... Obviously, the internet is a, is a long way from being invented. There were games on TV, but they weren't that regular. Um, and so I hadn't been to a game. And I, You know, I played at school. I played in the Epps Manual Under-10 team in, I guess it was the Epps Manual League. And... One of the players, his name was Ross, he had a granddad. Um, now, his granddad, so I don't, I'd actually, in the way that when you're a kid, you don't question these things. I've no idea like who his, where his parents were, but his granddad took him to all the games. I, I don't know if there's some tragedy there, but all I knew is, you know, Ross's granddad took him to games. And Ross's granddad was friends with Alan Cork. Um, and somehow, looking back now, when I was sort of reminiscing about this, I'm thinking, well, I don't know how old granddads of 10-year-olds are and why they're friends with professional footballers who are probably, even though Alan Court was probably already bald in his 20s. Um, oh, yeah. it was, anyway, somehow they were friends and somehow, therefore, my whole football team went to watch Wimbledon together. Because, mm-hmm. um, you know, he was, Ross was a fan of Wimbledon because his, his granddad was. So we, we went to this guy's house and we got the train up there and then we walked from the, from the station to the ground and I went into what was Plough Lane Um and so, as you know, Richard, but maybe some of the younger listeners don't, there was a thing before the Premier League called the First Division. And obviously, yeah. Wimbledon, Wimbledon were good in those days. I, I didn't become a fan because they were good, if you know what I mean, uh, in the way that no. people do now. I became a fan because there was this, you know, there was nothing coming from my family. So it came from my teammates and it was Wimbledon. Um, and we played Manchester City and we beat them. Um, and John Fashion, who scored a, an aggressive header, um, into the top there's, corner. There's a surprise, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think that I remember from those days, I mean, we were, you know, I was 12 and, you know, you'd say there's, you don't really know what's going on. But I remember just, I was sitting there, it was in the family enclosure, uh, which is a weird name. I don't know if they call them that anymore, but enclosure feels like the wrong word, but that was what it was called. It was a family enclosure. You know, we got a program, the mascot came around and said hello to us. 
Um, I don't remember like if we ate Bovril or whatever the equivalent was. Um, I think we didn't because we were, we were quite a big group. Um, but I remember going there and I think we, we got taken to some belly of the stadium somewhere to be introduced to somebody. And I don't know who it was. It wasn't a player, but there was some official came and talked to us because we'd come as a first group and at small teams, not Ross, had, you know, Ross's granddad had probably called Alan Cork and said this group are coming. And we were definitely made to feel special. Um, and I just remember loving it. Um, and, you know, being there with my friends, cheering on the team, they won. It was exciting. Um, and I, I remember reading like every, every single word in the program on the way home um, in the day. And, I, you know, one thing in America, they don't do football programs. I just I, I still love programs. I, re- I read everything because I didn't know who the people were. And I didn't know about this thing. And there was fan of the week and all this sort of stuff. It was all fascinating. And I remember going home and saying to my dad, can I go every week? Um, and then we ended up, I don't know if we ever had season tickets or we just, he definitely did. And I just ended up, so the, the team didn't all go together, but I went with this kid and his granddad to a lot of the games that year. And then obviously, as I went through, as a season ticket there for years as a result. And that's when I became a Wimbledon fan. I've, I've remained ever since, even though the club has changed grounds a few times. Changed grounds and changed a few other things as well. So yeah. we will be going into that in a little bit of detail. So did you say that because your dad wasn't really into football uh, and it's amazing how often people I get on this podcast, their dads were not into it. It was a friend of the family or someone else who introduced them. But did you say you then got your dad into it and he started taking season tickets? So that's good working. up. No, so he let me oh, get one and I still oh. went with the friend. Um, I think that... The first that game I ever took my dad to mm-hmm. was about, where are we now? Must be 30 years later. When Wimbledon were in the League Two playoff final, uh, our only other trip to Wembley apart from the FA Cup, um, yes. I flew back from LA for 36 hours and I took my dad and a load of friends to, to Wembley for, for our victory over Plymouth. Um, and actually, yes, yeah, so I've only been to one football game with my dad um, and that was... Um, uh, the, a playoff final at Wembley. Um, that, that's not bad, is it? Um, funny enough, no. I don't know if you know, but I've actually written, I wrote a book about the playoffs, oh. which I updated, and funny enough, the last match in my index, I know it's gone on a bit longer, you won't be able to see this, anybody, who's, but it's actually that game. Amazing. So at the bottom here, you've got 2016, League 2, Monday the 30th of May, we're AFC Wimbledon 2, Plymouth Argonne. And I was there because I go to every playoff final, you know, because the EFL quite like the fact I've written a book about them. And I do remember it was a huge crowd. It was 50. I mean, there were a lot of Plymouth there, but I think it yeah. was, oh, no, was, was 7,956, which is a little bit more than when you went to Plough Lane in 1989 because that was 6,815. But being a kid, you probably weren't counting how many people were there. No, you were, but, you know, I. I was at the Wimbledon game at the time. I don't think I realised, but when Wimbledon played Everton in what is, I think it was like four and a half thousand there. It's the lowest ever Premier League crowd. Um, three thousand actually, three thousand. Because I've also written another book. book about I'll stop going on, Richard. About <laughs> it's called Premier League Nuggets, and I happen to know that Wimbledon Everton game is indeed the lowest in the Premier League. It was in the first season. I think it was February ninety three. And it was three odd thousand. It wasn't even four thousand, which is. But you were there, so you you got a badge of honour being at yeah. the lowest ever Premier League game. It's just and great, I, you know. I not that it's a, a very good statistic, but I I run a professional soccer team now with a sorry, professional football team now with a five and a half thousand seat stadium. And I remember I was talking to them. We we sold the stadium out, and I said, I want you to know that we've got more people in today than the lowest, I think, 15 Premier League crowds. So yeah, there are more people yeah. watching second-tier soccer in Orange County today than we're, we're watching my team in the Premier League. And not just my team. I mean, I think Wimbledon have three or four of the bottom 10 crowds or the top Definitely. 10 lowest yeah, crowds. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah. But there were some other real teams in there who also had some poor crowds in the early days of the Premier League. But yeah, I think being a Wimbledon fan, you often are subjected to small numbers. I remember when I went to university, I was living in Yorkshire in a 
friend of mine uh, was an Everton fan. So we went to, he was a season ticket holder. So we went to Goodison Park and I, I, I don't quite know how they knew how the number was so small. But when they announced the crowd, they said, and we welcome the 42 fans who've come from Wimbledon um, right. who were sitting in the away section. because I guess they'd only bought 42 tickets and, I was sitting in the, in the Everton end because Wimbledon are not a threat to people. We're not like a normal team where if you sit in your way and you might get beaten up. Because even when we yeah. were sort of quite good, we had, we're still just Wimbledon. So he, you know, he was fine having me in his end and they beat us, I think, 4-0 that day anyway. But, um, when they did this announcement, he like picked me up and lifted up my arm and shouted, <laughs> 43. And then, you know, and gave me a cheer. Um, yeah. and uh, Wimbledon are, the irony is we were not well followed. We have some of the lowest crowds in the Premier League. But if you look at the the inverse of that, is if you look at the record book for the Seagrave Haulage South East Combination League, which is where AFC Wimbledon were in their first year of existence, every single team in that league, their record crowd is when they played Wimbledon. Because I think the league average was like three or four hundred, and we were bringing three or four thousand to every game. So yeah. our fans watched, as many of them watched Premier League football as they did whatever it is, 13th tier football, which says something about the club. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, all right-minded football fans loved the Phoenix club that AFC Wimbledon became and the fact that you rose up the leagues. I think I'm right in saying you won six promotions in the space of 13 years, which is pretty incredible and reached League One. I mean, you're now slipped back to League Two, but I'm sure that won't last very long. Um, but it's in, for the younger brethren of the audience, you see, they won't really remember the old Wimbledon. And I think we need to peek into the old Wimbledon. Because he's saying, I don't think any fans have necessarily got a right. I mean, I'm a Palace fan. I don't look on Wimbledon as a rival, although it's quite close. Um, Brighton is much easier because it's, you know, it's 26 miles away. But... As you're right in saying, I don't think anyone ever thought of oh, Wimbledon, we don't want them round here. But basically, the team of that era, most of the hooligans were actually on the pitch. <laughs> so you've got Vinnie Jones, you've got Dennis Wise, you've got John Fashionu, who were not shrinking violets. You know, they, they were tough guys. And, and as you pointed out, a year before your first game, they had the temerity to beat Liverpool 1-0 in the FA Cup final. I mean, how outrageous was that? Do you actually remember that in terms of watching on television? Because you'd have then been 11, so you'd have been not... You weren't a Wimbledon fan just yet, but you you must remember watching the final. Yeah, I, I do. I mean, you know, because everyone in England watched the FA Cup final. And I used to yeah. do it... I feel like it was nine o'clock in the morning it started. Maybe it was 12. It's one of those, yes. like, I can't remember. I remember it was a solid block. And whatever the solid block was, I would watch it all. You know, it's the it's the whole thing. You know, it's not just the players arriving. It's the story of the right. season. They show the goals from the first qualifying round, the whole thing. But, you know, on a Saturday morning, you, I would watch the whole way through to the cup run for years as a kid. So, you know, I... I like football, even though my like my my dad didn't, as it were. Um, and um, so I definitely watched the game, and I was sort of, even though I hadn't, I don't think I'd been, to, I hadn't been to a Wimbledon game yet. No. They were, I sort of, I supported them in that game because, you know, the, the crazy gang versus the Culture Club. Um, yes. you know, I, I want, I wanted them to win because they were the underdogs, and everyone liked that. And I was, I. Knew a little bit about Wimbledon because they were geographically proximate to us anyway. And my friend's granddad kept talking about them, would turn up in, you know, watching Epsom and Newell under 10s or under 9s, maybe it was the year before, wearing his Wimbledon yeah. scarf and so on. So I sort of knew of them. But, you know, obviously I had no sense of what that game meant until obviously I became a fan and then I realised what it meant. And also I think when I became a fan, winning the FA Cup was obviously a, a big deal, but we were first division, then Premier League. We beat Arsenal and Manchester United and obviously Manchester City in my first game and Liverpool semi-regularly. Like, it's hard to mm. believe now. We, you know, I was sort of almost in preparation for this podcast and maybe go back and look at some of the stats. And, you know, we finished 
sixth, seventh, eighth in the table. We mm-hmm. would have been in the Europa Conference League had they invented it. Um, you know, yes. and we would have been in the, you know, we would have had lines, broken lines under our position a couple of times yeah, yeah. probably. Um, and that obviously feels like a very long way away. And when you talk to people now, obviously people in America have no idea who Wimbledon are. Um, but even people in England, I don't think they all realise that Wimbledon were a legitimate first division team for a while. And winning the oh, FA yeah. Cup was obviously an anomaly, but finishing sixth or seventh in the in the first division and winning the FA Cup isn't that anomalous. It's not like um, you know, a team winning the FA Cup from the from the second tier, as it were. No. Um so you know, in those old days, the old Wimbledon, I mean, there was always, a, they were always a different team. The crowds were lower. They definitely had a unique style of play, a unique bond uh, as a team. But they were, they could compete. And I think I remember, you know, like, obviously, Fashion who scored in the first game I, I watched. And I know Dennis Wise was playing in that. But, yeah, over the years, obviously, you had the Vinnie Joneses and stuff. And, obviously, you know, Vinnie Jones did some very specific bad things that are captured in imagery. Obviously, Paul Gascoigne is part yes. of that but even more, if you actually watch him day in day out like he wasn't a bad player he was actually a remarkably skillful midfielder and I mean he scored an overhead kick in one game um like he, he was a he was a legitimate footballer but now obviously you, what you remember is the the tackle 12 seconds into the final on Steve McMahon which yeah. probably would have been a red card today I don't think it was even a booking in those days um you know so he's remembered for those things, but he was quite skillful. And, and Dennis Wise was in his own way. John Fashionu sort of was, but slightly less. I mean, he played for England. Like he was, he scored yeah, goals. Yeah. I do remember, and obviously, you know, with, with age, you look back on these things differently, but I feel like there was at least two occasions, and I think it might actually in real life have only been one, where he was sent off while on a stretcher. Um, so like he <laughs> went up, elbowed somebody in the face, and then yeah. clapped his head with them and then got stretched off. And the referee's like holding the red card above his prone body as he's being yeah. carried off. That definitely happened once. In my head, it happened two or three times. Um, but they were they were a, a great team to watch in that sense because, and you'll know this as a fan, the players you love on your team are the ones you hate on the opposition. Um, yeah. And so I think people didn't like playing against Wimbledon because of that. And it was the aggressive style of play in the day that, you know, it was a lot harder to get a booking um, than it is nowadays. But also, like, Plough Lane, which now is beautiful in those days, was not great. And when I was a kid, you don't really know. But when I talk to pros now, they talk about, like, how awful the dressing room was, the fact that, like, our team would play music really loudly so they couldn't even hear their own gaffer talking to them. Like, there was a lot of stuff that went on that made Wimbledon just not a nice team to play against. I think the other day, in our league out here in America, there's a team called Monterey Bay, and the manager's a chap called Frank Yallop. Um, and I was talking Ipswich, to him. wasn't he? Ipswich. Yeah, and I, I was talking to him the other I made him feel very old, but I was talking to him when we played them the other day, and he said he used to hate a, he felt old because I remembered watching him as like a 13-year-old play against Wimbledon. <laughs> but he was yeah. he was saying to me, like, he just, he hated it. Uh, because you'd go there and it was unfriendly and people were mean. Um, and the players were awful and they would, you know, they'd like stand on your on your ankles at corners. Even, like, not just in the like, niggly games. They just sort of did it all the time. And Vinnie Jones mm-hmm. used to pick you up by your armpit hair and all that sort of stuff. And that was just, it was just not a nice place to go. But when you're a fan of that team, it's it's amazing because they're, they're your people doing those mean things. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, quite often when a player moves, you know, so Dennis Wise goes to Chelsea, you probably immediately hate Dennis Wise because he's just, you know, he's that player. You know, he's... Yeah. He's a niggly guy. He's always, he, he was always chatting. He was one of those who just didn't stop talking. And I'm sure he wound opposition players up immensely because he was just, he was just irritating. But as you say, when he's on your side, oh, he's great because he's winding everyone up. He's putting them off their game. And again, you know, Dennis Wise was a skillful player, played for England. You know, he, he had certain attributes which, sometimes get hidden under the the rough stuff, under the slightly, you know, the irritating persona. Uh, and you forget how good a player he was. And as you say, Jones, I remember Vinnie Jones sort of striding through midfield. He had this way of just eating up the turf. And, you know, he was good. 
and he went forward and you 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 probably weren't going to get in his way but he could pass he could he could take the ball on so that image of oh Vinnie Jones was just a hard man is not actually the case so yeah I, I absolutely get that you know and he's obviously gone on to become famous in other other aspects which you will know very well yeah, no, indeed. I, I think one thing was interesting about Wimbledon. I think somehow, even when we were a big club, we we were still a small club. And I think mm-hmm. one of the issues being a small club, uh, sorry, not one of the issues, one of the upsides being a small club is we had a real love for our players when they were, even when they left. I feel like now if a player leaves a team, you know, they've, they're a traitor. Um, yeah. But I think for us, people sometimes couldn't get picked for England if they were at Wimbledon still. So we quite liked it. Like we liked to talk about people like John Scales that played mm-hmm. for us, but then went off and played for Liverpool and Spurs and, and played for England. Um, and we had quite a lot of people like that where, you know, obviously Vinnie Jones and Dennis Wise, but Chelsea and Vinnie Jones, but Leeds as well. And I think we sort of didn't mind them leaving. Um, it, I mean, we obviously minded them leaving in the moment, but we were sort of proud yeah. that they used to play for us. And they've gone on to big things because I think there was always this sort of us against them, small team mentality. So we knew we could compete at that level. But, you know, if our players wanted to go off and play afterwards for, you know, a bigger team, that sort of that was OK, uh, if you see yeah. what I mean. And obviously it definitely applies. It's, it's obviously very different now. But now as AFC Wimbledon, like if you ask most Wimbledon fans at the moment sort of who they're favourite ex-player is. I think everyone, it's Aaron Ramsdale who was on loan to us um, yeah. and was brilliant for us. But then like him going on to, until we got sort of slightly screwed over at Arsenal, him going on yeah. to play for Arsenal for England, for AFC Wimbledon to have an ex-player playing for England when we're, you know, languishing in the fourth division is great. And I think, although lots of little teams are proud of players who go on, I think we had that even when we were in the first division. We sort of, there was something about our players going off to play. I think, so Warren Barton, who lives out here, and yes. I know reasonably well. Again, at the time, I don't remember this, but when he got transferred to Newcastle, he was the most expensive defender in England when he was bought from us. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, the millions of dollars we got, in that, I mean, four million pounds sorry back in those days probably quite a lot of money um but you know having the most expensive player in our team is is great um and he's gone on to do to you know he did great things he played for england as well um so we always had that sort of you know play for us be part of our culture and when you leave you're still part of the wimbledon family yeah no i I absolutely agree with you as you say Probably the smaller the club, the more the affinity you have with those players. And you don't get pissed off if they move on because you understand, you know, there's a process and you get to be really good. You're probably going to outgrow the side. But, uh, yep. you know, Wimbledon then, as you say, were a top 10 club, you know, three or four times probably in that period, at the end of the Division One, start of the Premier League. And no one wants to play them. Because they were pretty good. And, and, you know, if you look through the team that played that day, which I'm sure we have, Hans Seggers, I remember very well in goal. You know, you know, in those days, before the invasion of lots of people outside the UK, it was sometimes quite exotic to have someone who wasn't British. So yes. this guy suddenly is in goal. And you go... Well, who's Hans Seggers, you know? Yeah. And he was a good goalkeeper. I remember him very clearly. You had Keith Curl, who obviously went on to <clears throat> become a manager at various places. Roger Joseph, who I do remember. One guy I do not remember, Detsy Krasnitsky. Yeah. Any when idea? Was, no. So when I was looking through the, this as well, a lot of them I remember, you know. Yeah posters I had on my wall and so on. And you, you conflate it. Obviously, when you're older, you you conflate who was who and who played in which team. In my head, like, the team that played together was, you know, Warren Barton, Robbie Earl, Carlton Fellweather, John Fashionu. Mm-hmm. They kind of all played together because some of them no. were in the um, But for me, they were all in the team together. But I looked at that name and all the other names, even like Roger Joseph is a name I haven't heard for a while, but I remember who mm-hmm. he was, what he did. But yeah. that, that could be a made-up name I wouldn't know. I have no idea who he is. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, it, Terry Phelan, I remember, you know, small guy, but skillful. John Scales, as you've already mentioned, Colton Fairweather. Born Ryan absolutely means nothing to me. I don't know no, who I he is. I can't visualise him. 
Yeah, he was a midfielder. Uh, he was can't have been amazing, but he was definitely. I remember. I don't know. He was one of those. I feel like I met him at. There was a. There was a thing we had. What was it called? It was like the supporters' club had a youth team. So it wasn't the youth team, as it were, no. but it was the supporters' club youth team. And I don't know if they still do these sorts of things, but there was a supporters' club team. So there was a team that played on behalf of Wimbledon as their supporters' club. And we would sometimes play against other First Division Premier League teams on the uh, on the same day at the same place. So I remember going up to, like, we were playing Bur- uh, Villa. So we went up to Villa Park and... I remember we got the coach up early and I played on the field at Villa Park. I think it was like maybe seven aside, like a one half of it, uh, like three hours before the real game. Yeah. The Wimbledon Supporters Club under whatever we were, 13, 14, we played. So I was involved, like I say, I wasn't in the team in the team, but I was in this sort of youth team thing. We played in the colours, but we weren't, you know, we weren't the real youth teams. We weren't very good, but we were, you know, we were just fans, Uh, but it was great. And, um, but I feel like Vaughan Ryan like took one of our training sessions or played against us in some way or did something with us. So even though he's I'm not sure how memorable he was as a footballer, I remember definitely meeting him at some point and him being involved in our kids thing. But you know, playing at Villa Park when you're a kid yeah, is yeah. great. Um, Absolutely. Lovely stadium <laughs> compared to Plough Lane, no offence. And also compared to that other horrible ground we spent a lot of time. What was it called again? Oh yeah, Selhurst Park. <laughs> Um, oh Dan, sorry, we're going to have to cut the podcast. <laughs> no, we will get to that. We will get to that because obviously, Plough Lane, um, Sam Hamam had other ideas. Sold it in the end to a supermarket, didn't he? Um, yeah. Let, let's finish the let's finish the team lineup, and then you sorry. can have a go at Southhurst Park. I mean, I've had Charlie Connolly on here, who was a Charlton fan. So I've been through all. Oh, you were horrible. Good. We were just the landlord. Guys, we we yeah, yeah. It, we're not the yeah. bad people. Where could you have played? Come on, yeah. we, we're we were helping you out. Ron oh, knows. Thank you for that. that. Thank you for that. Richard. That great benefactor of football, Ron <laughs> knows. Uh, so yeah, Dennis Wise, John Fashion, Terry Gibson. Now Terry Gibson again, terrier of a player, skillful, quite small as I remember him. But you know, he went on to commentate on Spanish football. Yeah. Which I, I, if you'd have said to me, out of any of these players, who would go on to commentate on Spanish football? Terry Gibson wouldn't be in my top five, I must say. But no, there he we're, is. We're Wimbledon players, for some reason, I don't know what it is, are drawn to commentary. So when I when I yeah. moved out to America in my first year here, I met Warren Barton, who was the doing mm-hmm. Fox at the time. Um, and I met Robbie Earl, who was doing MB and still is doing NBC, and they're both still out here. Um, now, what's slightly irritating is, you know, they describe Warren Barton as ex Newcastle defender, you know, because mm. I think if you put ex Wimbledon defector on the on the, on the <laughs> Chiron, I don't think anyone know what that means. And then they probably think he played tennis. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, indeed. Um, and even for Robbie Earl, I think they, I don't remember them calling him a Wimbledon midfielder. They probably was he Stoke. I think they. We would have said for him instead. It was originally Port Vale, wasn't he? But I don't yeah. think they put Port Vale up because they get very <laughs> confused. Port, yeah, no one well. knows who Port Vale is apart from the fact. Robbie but I think Williams. he did end up at Stoke, possibly. Yeah, because um, Port but, Vale. Yeah. But yeah, I met them out here uh, quite early on in my time here and became friends with certainly with Warren. Um, mm. And it was interesting because yeah, they're, they're commentating, and then yeah, Terry, Terry Gibson also seems to commentate. So I don't know if. Like Bobby Gould was like giving people sort of tips on how to be commentators or something because you know some of that team have graduated into the media world and, and good luck to them. Yeah, uh, and you're right because Bobby Gould was the manager and he'd been the manager when you won the FA Cup the season before. Looking at the city side, there are a couple of names that sort of leapt out at me, let's say, because Paul Cooper was the keeper and. <clears throat> I had Ali Bruce Ball, who's the Five Live commentator, about um, the episode came out last week. And he's an Ipswich fan. He remembers Paul Cooper very clearly in his first game. Because, I, I, as we discussed, he wasn't a big guy, but he was a very good goalkeeper. But nowadays, you obviously have to be six foot five and massive to be a goalkeeper. But he wasn't at that. Um, but the, the, the other one that, funny you should talk about commentators, because in the City team that day was Andy Hinchcliffe who is now 
a regular co-commentator on Sky. Uh, I'm trying to see if there are any other commentators. No, don't seem to be any other commentators. Paul Lake, though, who got very was very unlucky with injuries, had a really bad injury in that finished his career, basically. But, you know, what I like to look at here, just for a brief moment, is you've got Wimbledon, as you say, who are a Division One side, well-established and will be for quite a few years. But then you've got Man City, who we all know are about to win the Premier League for the fourth time running, won the Champions League last season. You know, they are the behemoth of English, let alone European football. <clears throat> You what you chart the progress stroke, you know, decline of both these clubs. So Wimbledon stayed in the Premier League for six, seven years and then slowly filtered down. And we're going to go on to what happened to them uh, in the early 2000s. But Man City were, were always at this period, they were sort of in and out, weren't really there, they dropped down to second division. But kids, Man City ended up in the third tier and in the most famous playoff final possibly ever were 2 nil down to Gillingham in the third tier playoff final and it was 90 minutes in and half of Man City fans left. I've spoken to Man City fans who claim they didn't leave so I don't know wh- which ones left, probably the Gallagher brothers, but they were so close to having their second season in the third tier and do you know what, if they hadn't recovered, Paul Dickoff scored the second goal in the 95th minute and they went on to beat him on penalties. I would suggest that they may not be where they are now. So you watch the the two teams and, you know, Wimbledon kept going, Man City sort of drifted away. But in that period, Man City did drop down seriously and were in big trouble uh, until, you know, very late intervention. So... How did you view it? So you enjoyed Wimbledon being at the top of the tree. Now we have to look at moving out of Plough Lane, which I know we're going to talk about. You need to talk about what I'd like to do quickly before we move to Sellers Park is, do you remember the last game Wimbledon played at the old Plough Lane? No, it's funny. I was thinking about that and I don't. Um, Well, I I do because I was there. Because it was against it was against Crystal Palace, <clears throat> and Ian Wright scored a hat trick. Three nil to Palace. I, I was in the away end, uh, and I can't remember. Did I go to Plough Lane? Apart from that, I might have gone another time, but I don't really remember it. As you say, <clears throat> rickety. I think is the word we'd use for it. It wasn't plush. It was you know that was just a terrace where we were. Lovely to see Ian Wright score a hatchet, lovely little knob over the keeper, I remember. But it, it, for me, grounds like that, and it obviously doesn't exist anymore, and it, you know, we've got the new plough lane, which is slightly, for, uh, you know, it's a little bit of a distance away from the old one. Um, grounds like that are still, for me, a fond memory because it was just rickety. It was, there was nothing plush about it, but it was quite fun to go to. And, and it was, in a way, much more intimate than, you know, the huge stadiums that have been built in the last 20 years. Um, so do you still retain a fondness for the rickety old plough lane? Yeah, I, I do. And I think I've spent a lot of my, I guess, I'm not calling it a footballing career, but my my relationship with football in not amazing stadia. Um, and I sort of like that. So, you know, obviously I went to Wembley when we won. Um, when I was a sports journalist, I, I think, you know, I went to some Premier League grounds. Uh, I know when I was a diplomat based in Germany, every time a British team played a German team, we had to send somebody and I I would go to them all. So, you know, I've been to, you know, I've been in, in the director's box sitting next to the owners and chairman of most of the Premier League teams who were playing in Europe when they were playing the Dortmunds and Colognes and Bayern Munichs of the world. So I've been to some amazing stadiums. But then, you know, refereeing in the sort of the reserve section of the Unibon League and Unibon League 2 meant lots of visits to, you know, small grounds. When I was in 
refereeing in Surrey in the Combination League and then doing the reserves of, I did a couple of conference games as fourth official and all that sort of stuff. So a lot of smallish stadia. Um, when I was a journalist in Yorkshire, I was the Bradford Park Avenue reporter. So wow. I was go to Bradford Park Avenue regularly, but obviously like, you know, Belper Town and all these other teams in the in the Uniborn mm-hmm. Premier League. So, you know, I've spent more time in stadia where the capacity is less than eight than I have in the big ones. And obviously, you know, I run a team who play in front of five and a half thousand people and a lot there's a couple of big teams like Louisville in our league have got seventeen thousand, but a lot of teams are in that ballpark. So I've been to, you know, the Las Vegas Stadium, the Sacramento Stadium, they're all a little bit smaller. And I think, I don't know, I feel, not as I feel more at home in those, but I think I, like I enjoy the big game. And, you know, I've been yeah. to the SoFi Stadium to watch the Chargers play. And that's, you know, one of the biggest, most impressive stadiums in the world. But I think for football, I think I'd rather be sitting with a, a few thousand than tens yeah. of thousands. I think it's just, yeah. there's something different about that. And I think that was what we grew up with in Wimbledon. We had a sort of slightly crappy ground. Um, mm. The facilities were sort of not great, um, but that, it, as you know, with with football, it doesn't matter. Like I didn't pick Wimbledon because they had the most comfortable seats. You know, I, I went there because they were the team I was drawn to as a kid, and then I got into it, and then you're that's you're stuck with it. Um, yeah. And so it, it was our home, as it were. Um, and you know, it is now, albeit slightly different, our home again. Yeah, and we do need to move to Selhurst Park because um, that happened in 1991. I'm actually surprised when I, I just checked how long you were there. You were there for a long time, weren't you? 12 years, which seems remarkable to me. Um, the lowest attendance, I've written it down, 3,039. See, if you hadn't been there, it would have been 3,038, which would have been yeah. really low. Um, uh, January, it's 26th of January, 1993. So what we need to do is we then need to move to the early 2000s when things really changed for the club and the move. Because I do remember this, that there were talks of moving to Dublin and all yeah. sorts of places. But in the end, some unknown reason, Milton Keynes became the place to go to. What were your immediate feelings when when you were going through that issue of oh we've got to move where are we going to end up did you ever feel confident you were going to be in a good place or did you always think this is going to turn out bad no, it felt like the team was dying um mm. so you know there was the when your owner is more interested in away attendance than home attendance you've got a problem because that's what it was all about. The reason we were going to move to Dublin is you would probably sell out every game because people want to watch Premier League yeah. football. Now, you might not sell out when you're playing against, I don't know, I can't remember who was bad in the first division in those days, whether it was in the Premier League, whether it was like Bolton or, you know, Nottingham Forest or something. But you'd definitely sell out a lot of the games because people would... So you'd, you'd make some new local fans, but basically it was about the away fans. That was what that, that was the Dublin move, uh, yeah. which didn't happen. I don't think I realised, I'm trying to remember how it all played out at the time, but I think now, you know, there were some files released the other, like the government got involved. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. like politicians were involved in, uh, in the whole thing. Um, but um, I think that's not a good sign. And it felt like the club no. was basically going to die because... Mm-hmm. When, when you're not looking at sustainable options that care about your fans, it, you're starting new in a completely new place. That's not great. So I think when it ended up going to Milton Keynes, it, I don't, I mean, maybe there are some fans who then became MK Don's fans, but if there are, they don't tell anybody and there was less than a hundred of them. But for everybody else, you know, that was it. That was the, the club was was going to be dead were it not for this, you know, bold group of individuals, a couple of whom I know, um, mm. who, you know, sat down in a pub in Wimbledon Common and said, let's make a new team. Um, and 
you know, they did open trials on Wimbledon Common and hundreds of people played. And I, I regret not, I mean, not that I would have got in, obviously, but I feel like I should have gone to that seminal moment in the club switch. I was living where I was, though. so I was away. I was living up north at the time. So after university, I stayed up north. So um, the only Wimbledon games I was watching in those days were like during Boxing Day when I came home for the holidays and when they were playing northern teams in away games. Um, yeah. And... Um, so I wasn't sort of, at, I feel like if I was living there, I would have maybe been in that pub with those people trying to work out how to save the club. Um, but um, they did indeed save it, uh, albeit, you know, starting right at the bottom. Um, and from afar, you know, I wanted to be part of it. So I didn't see them play for a while because they were playing in a regional division. So yeah. you know, if you're, you know, they were playing against Chessington and Hook United, um, and they were they weren't playing teams up north because that's not how the pyramid works for obvious reasons. Um, wow. And I think I actually think I refereed them before I watched them because wow. um, I was, you know, I was trying to work out all my dates and all this sort of stuff. But I, you know, I was refereeing a sort of Southern Combination League reserves of Ryman's League, some reserve mm -hmm. in FA Youth Cup all that sort of stuff. Um, and I think I did AFC Wimbledon in the, um, it was like a, is it called the Surrey Senior Cup or the London Senior Cup? It was like a... Surrey Senior, yeah, that's... Uh, yeah, yeah, it's a slightly weird thing where you have, prim I mean, I don't know, I guess they don't do it anymore. And if they do, they only play the kids. But in those days, like real teams would play in it alongside like Met, I remember like Met Police against, I think like Met Police against Crystal Palace. Like it was weird sort of... yeah way it worked but anyway I, I you know I, I did some of those games and so um, obviously I wasn't biased and in, at that level they don't check which team you support and take you off the yeah game. it's not like Mike it's Dean ridiculous. you know refereeing a Tranmere game everyone goes oh hang on you know and there was that ridiculous yeah. thing the other <clears throat> you know there's always a accusation of bias against referees which I think is inevitable but there was um, there was a list I saw I think it may have been on Twitter where it had each referee for the Premier League and who they supported. Yeah. Which was interesting because, you know, you have to declare your support and therefore you're not allowed to referee that game. So I think, for example, Michael Oliver comes from the North East, so he will never referee a Newcastle game, for example. Yeah, yeah. So I wanted to talk to you about refereeing because, as I say, you're the first ex-referee to come on here and, as I say, you might be the last. Um, do you... Do you remember refereeing your first, let's say, you know, semi-pro game? And, and what was that like? And there must have been a certain amount of nerves. And also, you know, refereeing, uh, you know, I've never, I've refereed half a game in my life. And it was the worst thing I've ever done because I just got pelters. Not only from the opposite, because I think I had to go and referee because someone was injured. And I was obviously from one side. But you can get pelters from your own side. You think, hang on yeah. a minute, I'm not doing this on purpose. It's just a mistake. I, it's weird. Like if my son today says he wants to be a referee, I tell him it's a terrible idea. It's the worst thing you can yeah. do. Because I think it definitely feels like the world is a worse place uh, for at low level. I mean, even at, it's not great at high level, but at least they're professional and get paid now. But at the low level, the sort of sort of violence on a Sunday morning and the abuse you get, it's its much worse. But it wasn't great in my day, but it definitely feels worse now. But I loved refereeing. It was a very weird thing. I, where are I? So I was like 14, I think it was. I realised, you know, I was playing, but I was in the school team and I was in my Epsom and team, but I was never going to be anything. Um, I think I did actually have a trial for the real Wimbledon youth team. And I think I played a couple of, like, I went to a couple of things with them, but it was never going to work. Um, and I'm not quite actually sure why at the time I'm like, I should referee instead. But I think it was actually uh, one of our neighbours in our street was a referee in the way these things work. Um, and he was a good referee, not not like top level, but definitely I think he was doing football league. Um, mm. It was on the EFL panel. And I think I was friends with his kid. And somehow I, I think he got me into it because um, he ended up being my assessor a few times as I worked through the levels. But, right. um, you know, when... When you're under 16, you can only referee up to your... No, when you're under... 
up to the age of 14, you can only referee kids up to your age. And then I think 14, yeah. you can start doing 16 and above, I think it was, or some, some version of that. So the first games I did were kids younger than me. Um, I was assaulted twice by people's mothers. Um, nothing major, but like a slap round the face from someone's mom. I mean, I'm like 14 and some woman hits me because her kid was injured near the side of the pitch. And I just sort of yeah. rolled him off and we could continue the game. And uh, she didn't like it. Um, right. it was very, it was very weird, but. I loved it and I joined the referee society and became part of that group. And then I got onto some sort of, I don't know what you would call it. It's like an apprentice scheme. Like I was in the, I was in the fast stream as it were. Yeah. Uh, and I got opportunities to do stuff. Premier League referees would come and talk at our monthly society meetings, which is quite mm-hmm. inspirational when you get uh, over the year, like Uriah, Uriah Rennie, Howard Webb. Yeah. Um, they Keith all came Hackett. and spoke to our stuff. I, Keith Hackett. Um, uh, there was some. There was a really interesting one, and there was this old dude. I wish I could remember his name. I was thinking about him the other day. He was old. He was still refereeing in like the part, not part, the top level of part football, like the combination league mm-hmm. in his, his like seventies, and he was old. But he used to referee in the old first division, and he would tell you the most amazing stories of. And like we didn't really believe him until you couldn't Google it in those days. But he brought programs on with his name. He refereed like Man United. He refereed in the old first division, but like in the he refereed George Best. Like he was legit, and he just couldn't give it up. Um, and he had this thing where he didn't book anybody anymore, uh, but he would right. reach into his pocket and pull out a packet of mints and give a mint. To the player. So it's this whole like routine he did every call. Come here, son, come here, son. And he reached into his pocket and have a mint, calm down. And apparently he did this trick in the George Best days. It was an extraordinary, man. Really? Uh, okay. People become very obsessed with refereeing. Uh, not not yeah. in a power trip way, but just it's a way of being involved in the game. And for me, the opportunities I had, um, you know, I refereed so I did some FA. FA Youth Cup games, first qualifying mm-hmm. round games of the FA Cup. I think the, the big thing for me is when uh, when I was older, I was living in Bermuda and I refereed in the Bermuda Premier League. And I did a referee. I was a, I was a linesman in the Bermuda FA Cup final, which I think was 6,000 people. Um, I did two or three international games. Um, I remember refereeing New England Revolution against Bermuda in a closed door friendly and Clint Dempsey scored. And then six weeks later, he scored in the World Cup quarterfinal. Um, so, you know, it's it gave you a proximity to, to football. Yeah, extraordinary. Um, and, you know, you, you know, you're a journalist and you have the same thing. Like, it's if you can't be a player, what's the next best thing? It's proximity. Um, and so, obviously, I was a journalist. So, I was obviously desperate to be involved in football in some way. So, I've been a journalist, a referee, and now I run a team. So, you know, everything but a good football. You're ticking them off as you go along. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, I mean, I had some, yeah, uh, extraordinary moments as a referee in terms of quality of players I refereed, things I saw, grounds I got to go to, people I got to meet. It was, uh, mm-hmm. it was amazing. And it, it's funny, it's the gift that keeps on giving. So, the other day, I was... Was it a golf tournament uh, out here? Uh, as it, um, watching the, it's a okay. champions. We're watching John Daly play, which is always fun. Um, yeah. And uh, I was introduced to Joe Max Moore, who played in three World Cups for America, played for Everton. Um, so big name over here. And we were chatting, and uh, he was at New England Revolution. I said. Oh, in 2000 and whatever it is, did you go to Bermuda on the tour? He's like, oh, yeah, I did. not I pulled out this picture on my phone and there's a, the lineups from the game at the right. National Stadium, Bermuda against New England Revolution. And there I am as assistant, as a linesman. And then the team photo for the New England team, which had Clint Dempsey and so on, and Joe Max Moore right. in it. And we're like, we were on the same field 20 years ago, um, wow. which is an extraordinary coincidence. But it, it's just, you got to do some amazing things that put you in the way that you, you know, you've had a, obviously a great career as a journalist. You've met some of the greatest players to have played. Uh, you've been at some amazing games, not just Wimbledon being Plymouth, but other ones. Uh, and <laughs> that's that's I, the high. I, After that, it all went down. Yeah. And for me, that refereeing gave me that. I mean, obviously I got abused, things thrown at me. Um, I think I remember we're in the Bermuda Cup final, the, the, the massive underdog. It was like a Wimbledon Liverpool game in the sense that it was the best team. So Sean Gota's team, um, oh, yeah, against like an upstart team. Um, and the upstart team 
scored a goal, which I disallowed for offside. And it was one of those one. It was a weird, and this is very specific, but it's one of those mm-hmm. specific moments where you are right because you're looking for a thing that no one else is looking for, but um, it it looks like you're massively wrong. Um, now on TV afterwards, I was vindicated, but in the stadium at the moment, it looked like I'd made an absolute howler. And it was, uh, I think it was the guy had a shot from thirty yards. Um, and my job, being in line with the last defender, is to look. And there was a guy in an offside position. But the guy shoots yeah. from 30 yards. Now, if it goes in, no offside. But if the ball hits the crossbar, bounces quite high up in the air, and then comes to this player, by which time all the defenders have now run past him, so he doesn't look like he could ever have been offside. So it yeah. must be a horrendous mistake. That was the goal I had to disallow. And uh, I was booed like you would not believe. Um, and on the like the TV news that night, they said it was all you know. I got it wrong, and then when they looked at the replay, I was I was vindicated. But that was not a great moment where thousands of people were shouting abuse at me for what looked like a horrendous mistake, um, but it wasn't. But as you say, you are the only person in that position because you're looking for it, and you're in line with the last defender. I mean, we don't need to go into the AR, but that actual physical line is is only you as you said and I'm, I'm sure as you say you probably got dogs abuse from all, all the supporters and the players etc but you know you've got to stick to your principles if you're right you're right and yeah. as you say you were vindicated later but probably didn't make up for the abuse you took um no, so i'm gonna indulge you well indulge myself right one more quite funny i think refereeing story was, yeah yeah no go we we don't have enough referees on here so uh, you, you, i, I need say- more referees you know how this works, of course. Uh, I, I hope I'm not giving away some massive trade secret, but players' columns are not always written by the player, I think is fair to say. Yeah, um, no, that's true. So, um, so I used to ghost write Sean Goethe's column uh, for yeah. the uh, paper in Bermuda I worked for, uh, which was called Read the Goat, which I was very proud of as a name um, for a weekly column rather than Feed the Goat. Anyway, um he played in, I think, I, I can't remember, I was trying to work it out the other day which game it was, but it was Bermuda against either Nicaragua or El Salvador. Um, he was playing. I was on the line. Um, I disallowed a goal for offside, um, which I, I don't know if I was right. I, there's not, it's not as clear to me. I mean, I think I was right at the time. I wouldn't have disallowed it otherwise. But he definitely did not agree with it. Anyway, he, in the heat of the game, not in the heat of the game, he didn't reckon, I mean, I knew him quite well, obviously, because I spoke to him every week. But on match day, I don't think he knew that I was lying to him because he's right. worrying about playing. So we, and, you know, I was on the far side and we didn't necessarily talk. So I don't think he knew I was lying to him. But I called him up on the Monday morning to do the column. And we started doing the column. I said, Diana, how did you find the game on Saturday against whoever it was? Mm-hmm. And we went through this whole thing. And he's like, he said, but the... There is no way I was offside. And, you know, these lines, they don't know what they're doing. And this was my chance to score at my home stadium for the first time in years. It's that whole thing. And obviously, I can't tell him he's wrong. It's his column because it's written in his yeah. words. So I had to write a column telling, explaining why the linesman had made such a horrendous decision, even though I was actually the said <laughs> linesman, um, which is somewhat unfortunate. But I'm a professional, so I let Sean... I wanted to change his words, but that's not what we do, Richard. So no, to. no, no, you can't. You know the sword of truth. You can't. You can't change it, can you? Good, good name for the column. Read the goat. Funnily enough, I run a football quiz here in London at a bar called Feed the Yak, which is in <laughs> Elephant and Castle, and is obviously oh. named after Yakubu. So yeah. you know we're, we're in sync here, Dan. It, it, it's yeah. working very I'm well. Right. <laughs> um, what I want to do is now switch a generation because I wanted to talk to you and I know you, you took your son to his first game uh, and that was, again, an AFC Wimbledon game. But he, he had quite a nice introduction because I believe he was the mascot, wasn't he? Yeah, so um, we were home for the summer um, and I wanted his first football game to be a Wimbledon game. So we resisted the urge to go to like LA Galaxy games and stuff over here. Um, so I called a club up and said, you know, can we do the whole mascot thing? Um, and we we were playing Burton Albion. It was in July because we were coming home for the summer holidays. And um, right. it was a pre-season game. And they don't do all the usual paraphernalia for pre-season games because... It's not an exciting moment to go out in front of a crowd of not very many people. 
and obviously Wimbledon are a League Two teams. We were playing Burton Albion. It was at Kings Meadow, um, but because it's a small club and they're nice, and I know some of the people there, they created some of the normal package stuff that you get. Um, so um, he was his name was on the front of the. So he we did everything. So he was like the right. match day sponsor and the mascot. So you know, as you know, at smaller teams. It says, I don't think a yeah. big team do it, but maybe they do. But the smaller teams, it said on the, it says literally on the front of the program, um, you know, today's, you know, today's match sponsor is, and it had his name. Um, him and my godson got, we turn up there, they've got kits laid out for them. We nice. go in the dressing room. I think because it was a pre season game, was, I think you get more than you would normally get. I don't know what you normally yeah. get because we've never done it, but. We were in the dressing room before the game, meeting all the players. We went and sat in Neil Ardley's office for a bit. And obviously for me, it was exciting because Neil Ardley was a player who I watched. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then, you know, the kids were out in the field warming up with the players, all the usual stuff. They walk out with the captain, all that stuff. And then after the game, he gets to pick the man of the match. So we're in the bar afterwards and all that stuff. And it was, you know, it, it was more for me than for him, let's be honest. But um, it was amazing so his first game he was walking out holding hands with the captain um and it was just such an extraordinary thing and i know you can i actually don't know how it works at a, a premier league team i don't know how palace do it uh, i don't know if they charge for it or if it's a kid they definitely local. charge for it yeah yeah, yeah I, mean, and I think it's frightening and they also have about 20 mascots so they're yeah maximizing the revenue basically yeah and for me i think it says something about this is why i've loved the Wimbledon thing all the way through is, and it's a result of being a smaller team, but you know, they created this for a fact. Now look, I mean, we paid some money, but I mean, it was nothing. Um, uh, but uh, he got to do all this special stuff, but he's a member of the junior Dons and mm-hmm. they get a card at Christmas and it's a car, a Christmas card and they get a birthday card as well. And they're signed by the players. Now, I know from a friend whose kid over here is a Spurs fan, when they get the Christmas card signed by the players, it's printed signatures because how can it not be? Because they're sending out down. This one is, it's real signatures from the men's team and the women's team. Now he doesn't recognise half the players and that's not really the point, but they're small enough that their players are handwriting birthday cards to kids. And that for me is why, even though I live 5,000 miles away and I've, you know, only seen Wimbledon play in the last, 25 years i've only maybe seen them play less than 10 times why we are such big fans of that club um because it's a community and i'm obviously a part owner as part of the way that a lot of wimbledon fans are um and it's just such a special bond because it's a community club and it it feels small and i think there's a there's a mix zone i think they call it like a fan autograph zone you can go to after games and we were back for a game and um, he got some autographs on the programme from some people. And there's one player who was his favourite player. And we were talking to the girl who was sort of managing this whole thing. And we said, oh, this, this guy, who wasn't even the best player on the team. It's like he was favourite player. And he came over to us and he talked to us for a while. Um, and I follow him on Instagram. And um, we, we, we showed, I put the picture of the two of them that we took up on there. And then he sent me like a DM saying, you know, let me know if you want me to send you a signed shirt. And like, he just... It was ridiculous. I think he was yeah. excited that he'd been anyone else's favourite player. But still, <laughs> um, like you don't get that at bigger teams. And, and there's a reason why you don't. It just doesn't work like that. But for us, that's part of the excitement. There's a proximity there. And I think even if something miraculous happens and we get three promotions and we end up back in the Premier League, I don't think that will change. Um, and I think that's what, for me, makes the club so special. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you. As you know, as we talked about earlier, it's the affinity. It's the almost like an intimacy between the club and the fan. And because Wimbledon are a fan-owned club, you know there are a few of these in in the league. But most of fan-owned clubs have come out of meltdown or disaster. They're not, you know, you don't suddenly Man United aren't thinking, oh, we should turn into a fan-owned club. They go and start their own FC United. So yeah. it. it but I, I love the idea of a fan-owned club because then you don't have, you know, owners who are not that interested in the football. They just use it as a brand. So there was a fact that I dug out the other day that you, the, of the 92 league clubs, so Premier League and EFL, 28 have American owners or part 
Alzheimer's. Yeah. 28. That's more than 30 odd percent, which, you know, okay, Americans can get involved in football, but a lot of them, you will know better than I do, a lot of Americans don't quite get English football. I know it's incredibly popular and, you know, NBC and et cetera, et cetera, and yet lots of games shown live um, across the States. But it, it just doesn't sit right with me because, you know, you've got the Glazers, for example, at Man United who are universally hated by the yeah. fans because they're taking out, you know, the income to pay off the money they borrow. I mean, we're not here to do finances. That would be another two hours. But what I do like about the Wimbledon story is not only the fact that you had to reinvent yourselves, but you did it via the fan-owned route. You came up through the division. So, as you say, you started in the combined Countess League playing Ashdod United, or it might be. But you're now back in the Football League, quite rightly. And there was that lovely moment when you went above MK Dons, which everyone celebrated, not just yourself. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I just think also the return to Plough Lane, I know it's a slightly, it's a new stadium, but it's still got that, Closeness and intimacy. I mean, it, what, what's the capacity? Six, seven thousand, is it? I think it might be eight, but yeah, it, okay. it's funny because it's lovely. Uh, like, it's really nice, and they've they've had to do it properly. Like, the corporate hospitality is is lovely, um, mm-hmm. but there's still something. It's like it, I went there for the first time. Uh, again, it was a pre-season game. We were playing Reading, yeah. um, and I went there on my own and. Got the train to the station, and I walk the, the the walk that you do. It's not very, it's, yeah. you know, it's far enough that it's a bit of a walk, but not too far. Lazy people get the bus, but I always walk. Um, and I sort of got there, and it, you know, you don't see it until you're on it. Like it's not like one of these stadiums, like I remember, like Pride Park, um, where you can like mm-hmm. it's an industrial estate and see it from miles away. Um, like you're walking along, and you're not sure you can see it until like you literally, because I'd never been there as well. So I was like following my map and I'm like, where was this stadium? And I walk past like a petrol station. I turn left and it's like, oh, there it is. And it's like set back from the road. And, mm-hmm. you know, there's no, there's no car park. Um, I think I was back last Christmas. I went there. There was a train strike as there so often is in England. And I'm like, I had to, yeah. had to get an Uber there um, because right. you can't, there's no park. It's not like one of these out of town stadium. You know, it's just there no, in no. the middle of like a housing estate and there's this stadium um, and there's nowhere to park. And it's great. But it, it's sort of, sort of, you go in and it is lovely. It was interesting. So I was standing there outside the front, um, just sort of looking at the crest on the side of the stadium and some bloke walked past me. And, and sort of looked at me. And I, th- I think I may have had a tear in my eye. And he's like, mm-hmm. first time, mate? And I'm like, I nodded. Um, and then I went in. And then I was in the club shop. And as somebody who lives on the other side of the world, I know you can buy online, but it's not the same. I love going in the club shop. And I, I drop, uh, you know, I always buy like four kits because they've always yeah. changed them. And I'll get some for my kid and whatever. And I went in there and I had like a whole load of stuff. And I got to the, the, the person and the, <laughs> the guy looked at me. And again, I think I might still have had a tear in my eye. And he's like, First time, mate. And like four people <laughs> that day had realised this wasn't the first year. This was the second yeah. season. So I didn't go at all in the first year because I just, I didn't come back from LA that first year. I think, yeah. was it post pandemic? I can't, can't remember. But um, I didn't go at all in the first year yeah. back. So it wasn't like it was the first couple of weeks. So it was a, a good year in. And mm. people noticed me looking emotional in a way that I guess they had seen people over the last year see it and they they yeah. came up to me and said you know you all right mate you know first time and it was it was very special um and i treated myself and got because the great thing about league two football is it's relatively inexpensive like the most expensive seat in the stadium i think is under 100 pounds um and that's the one that comes with like a five course meal and a briefing from the sure. manager and who knows yeah. what else so I, I'm like, if I'm going to do this, and it was a pre-season game, so I think it was like 50 pounds because you know the bar wasn't fully open yet, or whatever it was. And I went and sat there, and I was just like, this is this is great. Um, mm. And you've still got there's a block of flats just behind it, and there's people blatantly like watching the game off the balcony, um, which I, I think is lovely. It's not quite Kenilworth Road, but it's definitely no, no. No. it is it is small, but it, it's nice. And you know, they played the. They played it. Was it the women's FA? No, there was a women's league cup final. I think they played there last year, and the the 
London Broncos play there. There was an Australian women's international. Like it's a real stadium they can use for real revenue generating stuff uh, as well yeah. as their own team. But it still somehow feels like Plough Lane. And there's a little museum and it's great because not much of a museum, but you know, there's, there's the, the FA Cup trophy because obviously we sued to get our history back. So there's the FA mm. Cup trophy and then there's like, Dave Besant's shirt, and there's just all that sort of stuff. And there's a board with all the sort of, you know, people who've played for England while playing for Wimbledon and, uh, and some other sort of international honours. And I look at the board, and, you know, these are the names then. At that point, you recognise your your Warren Bartons and your John Fashionus. Yeah, yeah. And that's what, and your Vinnie Jones played for Wales, all that sort of stuff. And it's, you just feel, you feel like you're at home. And it's, it's so special. And obviously, I know a lot of the people at the club now, um so when i go back i you know, I'm always in nice seats and i only go once or twice a year but I think you know the mascot and i follow each other on social media and um you know there's still something every so often when i go back and i take pictures of them i always get a picture of the mascot even though it's meant to be for kids and i always post it on on twitter and there's something lovely about the little notification you get on your screen where it says you know hayden the womble liked your tweet and it's just <laughs> It sounds pathetic in a way, but in a way, I sort of I love that. That's what I love about my club that my our mascot knows who I am, um, and I think that's a sign that you're really part of the family, even though you live on the other side of the world. Yeah, so you're overcoming your geographical dis- distance, and it's still that proximity. So, yeah. you know, I, w- I would love to send a tweet to Pete the Eagle, but I don't think he'd ever reply. He's too big for his boots. Too yeah, Pete the Eagle's not. It's just not a, not a fan friend. <laughs> um, I mean, the unfortunate thing, I, I think I'm right in saying, is when Plough Lane was open, it was during COVID. So yeah. don't think anyone could go. And then there were very limited numbers that were allowed to go for a while. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's it's like when you talk to Brentford fans and they lost the playoff final to Fulham. And actually they said that was fine because it was during COVID and they didn't want to go back to the Premier League after such a long time out until you could get fans in and lo and behold, they won the yeah. playoffs the following year and crowds are back in. So the, those things, I think, make make a huge difference. You mentioned this, and, and I just want to touch on this. This is probably the last uh, thing I, I want to go through is, so you're 5,000 miles away. I know the Premier League is pretty much covered every game if you want to see it and Jim tells me he gets up at five o'clock in the morning to watch them and blah 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 but I'd imagine the coverage of League One and League Two is pretty minimal stroke invisible so how do you how do you follow I know there's I follow and people do that is is that how you follow the games it's got better Um, so I now pay £175 I think it is for the year to get right. I follow, so I can watch. I mean, it's cheaper than a season ticket, um, yeah. although I think ten times more expensive than the season ticket in the family enclosure when I was twelve. <laughs> um, uh, which, for some reason, I feel like was thirty-five pounds for the year. It may not have been, but it also may have been um, yeah. <laughs> um, in the uh, in the eighties. But um, the yes, yeah, so you get the you get the full game. So um, I'll get up at seven o'clock in the morning and I'll, I'll watch us, whoever we're playing. Um, mm-hmm. Every so often you hit the jackpot. So um, I think we we played West Ham in the League Cup, was it the FA Cup? Mm-hmm. a couple of years ago. That game was on ESPN Plus. So you get to you get to watch yeah. it you know, on a streaming service. Um, but yeah, I get to watch them all, but like the commentary is awful. No, I guess I shouldn't say that because I know the people who do it, but it, it's not amazing. You know, you're not getting yeah. TV commentary commentary. You're getting two yeah. fans watching sure. for an audience because it's not in England they broadcast this. It's only overseas. I think you can get the eye follow if I, I think that's okay. right. So I, I don't know how many Wimbledon fans live overseas who watch the game, but I imagine they're talking to an audience of less than 500. And I know that. I think again, it's a sign of things. So there's, I got one, I got one friend who's a Wimbledon fan who lives ten minutes away from me. And for big games, right. we we get together. He's got like a little home cinema in his house, and we were playing Bradford City the other day. And we had a mutual friend, so we, me and the Bradford City lad. So it's actually um, Ian Dennis, the uh, Five Live commentator. Oh um, yeah, his, his twin brother is one of my best friends out here. So um, oh, really, uh, yeah, so me, Steve Dennis, and. Uh, 
this uh, this guy Pete, we went to his house to watch Wimbledon Bradford on the on his like home cinema thing on iFollow, um, and I think we sent a message to the commentators because uh, we knew them and we got a shout out. It's like oh, we know that they you know tuning in from Los Angeles today. We've got you know. <laughs> Dan and the, you know Pete and his kids, and so he did a whole thing. And again, again, like it sounds pathetic, but nothing says you're a community club when you get mentioned on the broadcast um, because they're so excited that there's somebody yeah. from Los Angeles. Because, like for Man City, of course, there's people from Los Angeles, there's thousands of them. But mm. but for little and for little Wimbledon, it's a rare treat to have people tweet in to say they're watching the game. So they, they mentioned us. And again, that, that makes you feel part of the family. Absolutely. Well, I've, I've got Peter Drury uh, to record on here. So what I'm going to ask him to do is mention me on the next commentary he's, he's um, <laughs> doing. Probably won't make it, but there you go. Um, you know, it's not a real club either. So maybe you might be able to get on. Oh, hang on. Um, don't go down that route, Dan. We've been down that route. We're not going to do that. Uh, last thing. Sorry, I did say it. Was yeah. a, so you're in the States. and you're. I'm interested in the fact that you've become uh, a founder. I think you're president now of the Orange County Soccer Club. So can you remember the first match, you know, as the you know, you started this club? Here's the first match. That must have been an amazing experience say, this is my club. It, it's, you know, obviously analogous to Wimbledon because you're yeah. a fan owner and, and that sort of stuff. Yeah. So the club is, I think, 12 years old. So I joined the team four years ago. Um, yeah. And um, it's really interesting. Like, game day is really interesting. So I'm president of the club, but we're, you know, we're not a big staff. So I'm like a studio floor manager on the game day. So I've got my radio and they radio me to say, you know, can we open the gates? And they radio me to say that somebody's drunk and needs to be thrown out. And, you right. know, the national anthem singers here. And, you know, like I'm very much yeah. involved in game day. Hands it's on, not, I think they call it. Yeah, it's, yeah, you're not like sitting in the, in the box getting drunk with, you know, prospective sponsors and stuff. There's a lot of like running the, the operations of the game, which I, I love. Mm. Um, there's still a bit of running around. Jim Jim Piddock's wife has sung the anthem at our our stadium mm-hmm. uh, twice. Um, but the um, it, it's great. It's a lovely thing. But I think one of the things that I think is has been really special for me was it, when I took over the club. And you know, we're a small, it, really. I mean, five thousand seat. You know, it's it's relatively, yeah. but it's also relatively small. And there's a part of me it's like, wouldn't it be fun to do the ownership thing? But there was no reason to do it because. Nothing bad had happened to us, as it were. Um, so you can't just do it, as you say. You can't just do it for the sake of it, even though it's quite cool. You need a, you need a, a you know, a real reason. And unfortunately, I wasn't looking for one, but one came along. So we were eight days away from losing our stadium because LA Galaxy wanted to throw us out um, to put right. their reserve team in um, and take over the stadium as part of a long-term play to take over, like football fandom in Orange County, because they were losing mm-hmm. football fandom in LA to LAFC. Um, and it was extraordinary. Like we hit the media, we took the legal routes. Um, uh, where are we? Scores of our fans went to a council meeting and you know held up scarves and say, sung songs. And there was a whole campaign to save the club. And the Galaxy attempt to throw us out failed. The club was saved. Um, I spent a year trying to do a deal with the city who owned the stadium to keep us there. And we signed a 10 year deal. And the day after we signed a 10 year deal, we opened up fan ownership. So not a hundred percent like Wimbledon, but we put 5% of the club up for fans because they nearly lost the club and our bond with them completely changed because of this moment. And, uh, 1500 people are now part owners of Orange County investing anything between hundred dollars and fifty thousand dollars we've got some celebrities including john green the uh, celebrity wimbledon fan who's now a celebrity orange county fan as well and it's transformed how we operate as a club um you know they're season ticket holders who are now owners and it just it changes everything about how your relationship with each other and it's um it's a really special thing and I, I i copy a lot of things from wimbledon um, because we're a community club, our our business club where our sponsors get together once a month is something that I copied from Wimbledon. Our staff versus sponsors game on the field at the end of the season is something that I have copied. Mm-hmm. So we've tried to do a lot of that stuff 
not to be like Wimbledon, but because it worked for a club of that size. And I've tried to replicate some of that over here. Um, yeah. And it, and it's worked to an extent. And, you know, we, we're we building something special over here in the way that I was witness and part of building something special over there. So it's been a, it's great. Um, it's, it's, it's something very different and unique and, you know, I know Palace haven't been through quite what Wimbledon have, but you've had versions of it. And I know speaking yeah, yeah. to Jim, you know, who who was on the field at Palace talking about some of the things he had to go through as chair of the supporters trust, I think it was. Like there was adversity gives you something different. Um yeah. and, and you know ours was not as adverse as what happened to Wimbledon, but we have a version of that, which means now we have a relationship with our fans that is 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 unique and that's special. Um and that's what we're building the club for. Brilliant. Well, I think you should invite AFC Wimbledon over for a US tour and they should play Orange something, yeah, shouldn't they? Yeah, we have had those discussions. Um, right. The uh, Wimbledon tend not to go all the way to America for their pre-season oh, really? tours, do you okay. believe? Well, they only uh, go to Ireland, as far as Ireland. Yeah, they Dublin, go, I think they, that would be good, wouldn't it? <laughs> they have been going to Ireland. I think they're going to Spain this year for the second oh, okay. time. But that's that's the limits, unfortunately. But, well, uh, but yeah, I'd love to do that one day. But Yeah, well, I, I think it's something to aim for so um dan just what a great journey that's been and and again it's always unique because you started off wimbledon and then you know we we've been through from john fashionu all the way to sean gota and you having to write a column about this crap linesman who actually was yourself and then hayden the womble on Twitter. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. Um, so it's been a pleasure having you on. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, and, you know, spread the word in the States about it started with a kick because we really want to, you know, get into the, the US market. It'd be fantastic. But thanks very much. No, thank you. It's just been a, been a fun trip down memory lane. So thank you very much indeed. That's, that's one of the, that's one of the, the ways we do it. Thank you. Yeah.